Denmark Vesey is most well known for attempting the largest slave revolt in US history. Though his revolt was unsuccessful, his attempt quietly altered the fragile thinking of South Carolinian whites that their slaves were actually happy in their current condition. But in order to understand the revolt, we have to look into the man himself. Denmark Vesey's actual birthday is unknown, but he is registered to have been purchased in the Danish Virgin Islands. His original name was Telemac, and he was brought to the US by a Captain Joseph Vesey, who found the youth to be of striking beauty and intelligence. Originally, Captain Vesey sold Denmark, but after returning back to the Virgin Islands to pick up more slaves, the man who had bought him demanded a refund. He would claim that Denmark was not fit for field work and that he would have epileptic fits. Captain Vesey would agree to take Denmark back and refunded the money. After refunding the money, instead of punishing Denmark for loss of income and time, Joseph Vesey made him a personal assistant. After returning back to South Carolina, Captain Joseph Vesey would put Denmark to work as a carpenter. But what changed the course of his life was entering his name in the Charleston Lottery in 1799. A few months after entering his name, Denmark was informed that he was the winner. In total, he was awarded $1,500, 600 of which he would use to buy his freedom. Now as a free man, Denmark would quickly work to establish himself as a part of the Charleston community. He would buy a home, get married, and was a well-known and well-respected carpenter in both the black and white community. But though he was comfortable as a free man and of advanced age, Denmark was fed up with the slave conditions in South Carolina. He believed that the only thing needed to inspire the breakage of chains was a leader that can guide black slaves and help them realize that they should not be in their current condition. For at least 10 years, he had culminated relationships with well-respected slaves through the Charleston Marketplace, and also through his connections at the AME Church as he was a class leader for biblical instruction. At the AME Church, Vesey would tell the congregants that slavery and bondage were against the Bible. Churchgoers would say that Vesey had an aura of confidence and wisdom that evoked a sense of respect, awe, and fear. What also made Denmark Vesey able to recruit so many slaves to his cause was his ability to communicate with them and to recruit people that did. Denmark spoke many languages, including French, Dutch, Gullah, and Creole. One of his principal lieutenants was Jack Gullah Pritchard, a well-respected slave viewed by many in the community to be a sorcerer. Pritchard was very instrumental in organizing and recruiting. His presence made slaves in Charleston much more confident and comfortable in taking part in the revolt as they believed some of Pritchard's talismans would make them invulnerable to injury. Other important recruits was the current governor, Thomas Bennett's house slaves, Ned and Rolla. Both Ned and Rolla had the complete trust of their master and would be responsible for killing the governor on the planned day of the revolt. Vesey's advocacy for rebellion would rely on three main arguments. To the urban members of the former AME congregation, he would tell them that our church was shut up so that we could not use it and that it was high time for us to seek our rights. To the black slaves, he insisted that we were fully able to conquer the whites if we were only unanimous and courageous. And among the Gullahs, the first generation of African slaves, Vesey would take care to conduct magical rituals of empowerment and cultural identity. He would often take them to people regarded as sorcerers in the slave community, such as Jack Pritchard and other shamans. One of them, a blind man, would tell the gathered slaves that he had a gift of second sight and foresaw the upcoming rebellion and that they should not be afraid or troubled. Vesey's plan emphasized fire. Nothing could be done without fire, he would say. The plan was to set fires in multiple locations across the city, and as white residents came out when the bells rang, sounding the alarm, they would be slaughtered. All white men, women, and children, including infants, were to be killed. No white citizen was to be spared. And while the fires were raging, simultaneously, another group of slaves were going to attack weapon stores and the state arsenal at Meeting Street. Then Vesey, along with the other slaves of the city, would congregate in the town center and kill any white person that they saw. Once this was done, they were to only leave white ship captains alive and have them steer them to the Republic of Haiti, which recently had a successful slave rebellion of their own. Denmark would choose July 14, 1822 as a date of his rebellion. 
It was chosen because not only was it a Sunday, a day where blacks were allowed to congregate in the city market with little supervision, but it also became custom that many officers in the militia would escape the summer heat by vacationing as far as Rhode Island. Hence, the whites in the city would be even fewer in number than they already were and have less experienced military leaders on hand. As the day of the planned revolt came closer, complications would start to arise. On May 25, 1822, a house slave of Colonel John C. Prilu was fulfilling an errand for his mistress when he was approached by another slave who he did not know. The slave would ask Peter Prilu whether he heard something serious was going to take place. When Peter Prilu replied that he had not heard any particular news, the stranger later identified as William Paul would reply, why we are determined to shake off our bondage, and for this purpose, we stand on a firm foundation. Many have joined, and if you go with me, I will show you the man who has taken the list of names who will take yours down. Peter, terrified, broke off the conversation and immediately told his master what had happened. Peter's master, John Prilu, would then immediately notify the authorities. Peter's description would lead authorities to the slave, William Paul. After being interrogated for over 24 hours, Paul named some of Vesey's chief lieutenants, Peter Poyas, Mingo Harth, and the current governor's slave, Ned Bennett. Poyas and Harth were then questioned and quickly released after authorities could not obtain anything concrete, and the governor, Thomas Bennett, would refuse to believe that Ned had been involved. So sure of his loyalty that he told investigators that if Ned was named in the plot, it was obvious it was nonsense. As rumors continued to rise, one master, John Wilson, sent his slave George to inquire among the slaves if there was any truth to the rumors. The slave George Wilson was a trusted figure in the black community as he was a class leader in a local church. Late on June 14th, Wilson hurried home to his master to tell him what he had learned. It was true that there was a coming revolt. In fact, he was solicited to join it. Having this information confirmed, the authorities rallied immediately. The militia was put on high alert, and more men around the state would coalesce around Charleston. Weapons were being brought forth, and arrests were made. Because of these events, Vesey had decided to move up the date of his revolt to Sunday, June 16th, but noticed that there were simply too many militia men on the street. There was soon a meeting at Vesey's house, and some disagreement about what to do. Eventually, one of Denmark's lieutenants, Jesse Blackwood, who was in charge of bringing slaves from the countryside, would report failure. The white patrols would not let him leave the city under any circumstance. After hearing this, Vesey sent word to the rural slaves that had already arrived to leave and wait for further orders. He then ordered his lieutenants and officers to burn the list of names that they had written. As arrests continued the following week, more and more slaves started to confess and reveal details of the plot. Eventually, Vesey's chief lieutenants were arrested, and Vesey expected that after enough slaves had been tortured, his name would eventually come up. But since he was so well respected in the white community, it wasn't until a significant amount of slaves mentioned his name that authorities would finally decide to act and have him arrested. By Sunday, June 22nd, an official order was given to arrest Denmark, and he was later found and seized at his wife's residence. And soon, the trial would begin. For this trial, the intendant, James Hamilton Jr., decided to create a temporary court for all blacks arrested. There were no juries to be on the court, and its decisions, including death sentences, were not appealable to any higher state court. They did decide to offer the defendants the right to counsel, to know the identities of hostile witnesses, and to cross-examine and challenge other slaves' testimonies. Although the verdict was predetermined, looking at the evidence, it does not appear that it would have merited a guilty verdict in normal circumstances. Of the four slave testimonies against Vesey, only one witness, Frank Ferguson, testified specifically that Vesey had urged the city slaves to seize weapons. The other three testified only in general terms, impugning Vesey's character, but hardly corroborating Ferguson's testimony. Vesey, they claimed, would not like to have a white man in his presence, and that he was bitter towards the whites. The physical evidence of the attempted rebellion was also scant, and none of the lists of names that Vesey supposedly had were ever found. Vesey did try to defend himself valiantly. He personally cross-examined the black and mulatto witnesses brought against him. He at first would question them in a despotic manner, but this did not produce the desired effect. 
So he questioned them with surprise and concern for learning false testimony against him. After this too did not work, he then examined them strictly to the dates, but could not make them contradict themselves. On Thursday, June 27th, Vessi was brought into the small upstairs room at the workhouse where he was held and told the verdict. He was found guilty and was sentenced to hang. Neither at his sentencing nor at his hanging did he speak, but some of the judges did report that as the verdict was read, they saw tears on his face. On July 2nd, 1822, Denmark Vesey was no more, bringing an end to one of the first large-scale attempted slave revolts in American history.